Welcome to Friday. Now, as you all know, Friday is Prose Day, and have I got a treat for you. This is from a book we've looked at before, but there are so many different chapters in it that we could go on this for an entire year. It's called The Best American Short Stories of the Century. And it is uh, the editor is John Updike and Katerina Kennison is the co-editor. And we've read a number of stories from this, but I picked one that is very meaningful to me because as any of you who know me know, I love Tennessee Williams. And I've directed a number of his plays in the past. And something that has always intrigued me is the relationships within the family. In, uh, and I've mentioned this before, where would our short story trajectory be without the presence of magazines? In uh, one called Flair, in 1951, Tennessee Williams wrote this short story. There's truth in this fiction. It is entitled, The Resemblance Between a violin case and a coffin. It's inscribed to the memory of Isabel Sevier Williams. With her advantage of more than two years and the earlier maturity of girls, my sister, moved before me into that country of mysterious differences where children grow up. And although we naturally uh, continued to live in the same house, she seemed to have gone on a journey while she remained in sight. The difference came about more abruptly than you would think possible, and it was vast. It was like the two sides of the Sunflower River that ran through the town where we lived. On one side was a wilderness where giant cypresses seemed to engage in mute rites of reverence at the edge of the river, and the blurred pallor of Dobine Place that used to be a plantation now vacant and seemingly ravaged by some impalpable violence, fiercer than flames. And back of this dusky curtain, the immense cotton fields that absorb the whole visible distance in one sweeping gesture. But on the other side, avenues commerce, pavements, and homes of people. Uh, those two separated by only a, a yellowish, languorous stream that you could throw a rock over. The rumbling wooden bridge that divided or, or joined those banks was hardly shorter than the interval in which my sister moved away from me. Her look was startled. Mine? was bewildered and hurt. Either there was no explanation or, or none was permitted between the one departing and, and the one left behind. The earliest beginning of it that I can remember was one day when my sister got up later than usual with an odd look. Not as if she had been crying, well, although perhaps she had, but as though she had received some painful or, or, or frightening surprise, observed an equally odd difference in the manner toward her of my good mother and grandmother. She was escorted to the kitchen for breakfast as though she were in danger of toppling over on either side, and everything was handed to her as though she oh, could not reach for it. She was addressed in hushed 
and solicitous voices, almost the way docile servants speak to an employer. I was baffled and a little disgusted. I received no attention at all. And the one or two glances given me by my sister had a peculiar look of resentment in them. It was as if I had struck her the night before and given her a bloody nose or black eye, except that she wore no bruise, no visible injury. And there had been no altercation between us in recent days. I spoke to her several times, but for some reason she ignored my remarks, and when I became irritated and yelled at her, my grandmother suddenly reached over and twisted my ear, which was one of the few times that I can remember when she ever offered me more than the, the gentlest reproach. It was a Saturday morning, I remember, of a hot yellow day, and it was the hour when my sister and I would ordinarily take to the streets on our wheels. But the custom was now disregarded. And after breakfast, my sister appeared somewhat strengthened, but still alarmingly pale and as silent as ever. She was then escorted to the parlor, encouraged to sit down at the piano. She spoke in a low, whimpering tone, so my grandmother, who adjusted the piano stool very carefully and placed a cushion on it, and, well, she even turned the pages of sheet music for her as if she were incapable of finding the place for herself. She was working on a simple piece called the Aeolian Harp. My grandmother sat beside her while she played, counting out the tempo in a barely audible voice, now and then reaching out to touch the wrists of my sister in order to remind her to keep them arched. And in case you hear a little crackling thunder, we are in the midst of a bit of a storm here in Fernandina, but that's not going to stop us from reading this story about Tennessee Williams. But you just know, if you hear a crack, that's Thor up in the sky, just hurtling a thunderbolt down at us. But it's okay. He ain't going to hit us. Upstairs, now my mother began to sing to herself, which was something she only did when my father had just left on a long trip with his samples and would not be likely to return for quite a while. And my grandfather, up since daybreak, was mumbling a sermon to himself in the study. All was peaceful, except my sister's face. I did not know whether to go outside or stay in. I hung around the parlor a little while, and I finally said to Graham, why can't she just practice later? As if I had made some really brutal remark, my sister jumped up in tears and fled to her upstairs bedroom. Now, what was the matter with her? My grandmother said, Your sister is not well today. She said it gently and gravely. And then she started to follow my sister upstairs. And I, I was deserted. I was left alone in the very uninteresting parlor idea of riding alone on my wheel did not please me, for often when I did that, I was set upon by the rougher boys of town who called me preacher and took a particular delight in asking me obscene questions that would embarrass 
embarrass me to the point of nausea. In this way was instituted a time of estrangement that I could not understand. From that time on, the division between us was ever more clearly established. It seemed that my mother and grandmother were approving and conspiring to increase it. They had never before bothered over the fact that I had depended so much on the companionship of my sister. But now they were continually asking me why I did not make friends with other children. I was ashamed to tell them. The other children frightened me. Nor was I willing to admit that my sister's wild imagination and inexhaustible spirits made all other substitute companions seem like the shadows of shades. So now that she had abandoned me mysteriously and willfully withdrawn her enchanting intimacy, I felt too resentful even to acknowledge secretly to myself how much had been lost through what she had taken away. Sometimes, I think, she might have fled back into the more familiar country of childhood, if, if she had been allowed to. But the grown-up ladies of the house, and even the colored girl, Ozzy, were continually telling her uh, such and such a thing was just simply not proper for her to do. It was not proper for my sister not to wear stockings or to crouch in the yard at a place where the earth was worn bare to bounce a rubber ball and scoop up starry pointed bits of black metal called jacks. It was not even proper for me to come into her room without knocking. All of these proprieties struck me as mean, silly, and perverse. And the wound of them turned me inward. My sister had been magically suited to that wild country of childhood, but it remained to be seen how she would adapt herself to the uniform and yet more complex world that grown girls enter. I suspect that I have defined that world incorrectly with the word uniform. Later, yes, it does become a uniform, straightens out into an all too regular pattern. But between childhood and adulthood, there's a broken terrain which is possibly even wilder than childhood. The wilderness is interior, the bounds. The brambles seem to have been left behind, but actually they are thicker and more confusing, though they are not so noticeable from the outside. Those few years of dangerous passage are an ascent into unknown hills. They take the breath sometimes and bewilder the vision. My mother and maternal grandmother came of a calmer blood than my sister and I. They were unable to suspect the hazards that we were faced with, having in us the turbulent blood of our irreconcilables, fought for supremacy in us. Peace could never be made at best. A smoldering sort of armistice might be reached after many battles. Childhood had held those clashes in abeyance. They were somehow timed to explode at adolescence, 
violently shaken the earth where we were standing. Sister now all gold tremors under her feet seem to me that a shudder had fallen on her. Or, or had it fallen on me with her light at a distance? Yes, it was as if someone had carried a lamp into another room that I could not enter. I watched her from a distance and under a shudder. Looking back on it now, I see that those two or three years when the fatal dice was still in the tilted box were the years of her beauty. The long copperish curls which had swung below her shoulder, mother, and almost constantly with excitement, were unexpectedly removed one day. An afternoon of a day, soon after, the one when she had fled from the piano in reasonless tears, mother took her downtown. <laughs> I was uh, not allowed to go with him, but told once more to find someone to play with. My sister returned without her long curls. It was like a formal acknowledgement of the sorrowful differences and division which had haunted the house for some time. I noticed as she uh, came in the front uh, uh, front door that she had now begun to an intimate walk of grown ladies, the graceful, quick, decorous steps of my mother that she kept the queens at her sides, and sort of flung out as if brushing curtains aside as she sprang forward in the abruptly lost days. But there was much more than she entered the parlor. At the fading hour of the afternoon, it was as if uh, uh, momentous, as if brass horns had sounded. She wore such beauty. Mother came after her, looking flushed with excitement, and my grandmother descended the stir stairs with unusual lightness. Spoke in hushed voices. Astonishing, said my mother. She is Isabel. This was the name of a sister of my father's who was a famed beauty in Knoxville. She was probably the one woman in the world by whom my mother was intimidated. And our occasional summer journeys to Knoxville from the Delta of Mississippi were like priestly tributes to a seat of holiness for whom my mother would certainly never make verbal acknowledgement of my aunt's superiority in matters of taste and definitions of quality. It was, nevertheless, apparent that she approached Knoxville and my father's younger sister in something very close to fear and trembling. Isabel had a flame. Oh, there was no doubt about it. A lambency which felt would not fade from the eyes. It had an awful quality, as though it shone outward while, while it burned inward. Not long after the time of these recollections, she was to die oh, quite abruptly and irrelevantly as the result of the removal of an infected wisdom tooth. With her legend entrusted to various bewildered eyes and hearts and memories, she had stamped, including mine, which have sometimes confused her with very dissimilar ladies. She is Isabel, said my mother in a hushed voice. Grandmother admit that this was so. She also admired Isabel, but 
plot of interfering and was unable to separate her altogether from the excessively close blood connection with my father, who I should say in passage was a devilish man. in the spirit. Certainly, God delivered for his son to Isabella and my sister. That lone stranger whose beauty sharpened my sense of being alone. I saw that it was all over, put away in a box, and all no longer cared for the magic intimacy of our childhood together. Soap bubble afternoons and the games with paper dolls cut out of dress catalogs and the breathless races here and there on our wheels for the first time. Yes, that's all the beauty. I consciously about it myself. Oh, it seems to me that I turned away from it, averted my look from the pride with which she strolled into the parlor and stood by the mantel mirror to be admired. And it was then, about that time, that I began to find life unsatisfactory as an explanation of itself. I was forced to adopt the method of the artist not explaining, but putting the box together in some way other that seems more significant to him, which is rather a fancy way of saying I started writing. My sister also had a separate occupation, which was her study of music, at first conducted under my grandmother's instruction, but now entrusted to a professional teacher whose name was Miss Ailey, an almost typical spinster who lived in a small frame house with a porch covered by moon vines and a fence covered by honeysuckle. Her name was pronounced A. Lee. She supported herself and a paralyzed father by giving violin lessons and piano neither of which she played very well herself, but for which she had great gifts as a teacher. Great gifts, at least great enthusiasm. She was a true romanticist. She so excitedly that she got ahead of herself and looked bewildered and cried out, oh, I don't know, what was I saying? She was one of those innocents of the world appreciated only by her pupils and a few persons a generation older than herself. Her pupils nearly always came to adore her, and she gave them a feeling that uh, playing little pieces on the piano or scratching out little tunes on a fiddle made up for everything that was sensibly wrong in a world made by God but disarrayed by the devil. She was religious and distracted. She never admitted that any one of her pupils, even the ones who were unmistakably tone deaf, were deficient in musical talent. A few who could perform tolerably way well. <laughs> she was certain had genius. She had two real star pupils, a sister and a piano, and a boy named Richard Miles, who studied the violin. Her enthusiasm for these two was unbounded. Now it's true that my sister had a nice touch and that Richard Miles had a pure tone on the fiddle, but Miss Ailey dreamed of them in terms of playing duets, great ovations in the world's capital cities. Richard Miles. <laughs> I think of him now as a boy, for he was almost 17, but at that time, he seemed a complete adult to me, even immeasurably older than my sister, who was 14. I sensed him fiercely, even though I began almost immediately after learning of his existence to dream about him, as I had 
formerly dreamed about storybook heroes. His name began to influence the rest. It was almost constantly on the lips of my sister. A strange young lady who had come to live with us. Had a curious likeness, that name. In the way that she spoke it, did not seem to fall from her lips, but to be released from them. The moment spoken, it rose into the air and shimmered and floated and took on gorgeous colors. The way that so did that we used to flow from the sunny back steps in the summer. Those bubbles lifted and floated, and they eventually broke, but never until other, other bubbles had floated beside them. <laughs> Golden they were, in the name of Richard. Secondly, the miles gave a suggestion of, of distance. So Richard was something both radiant and far away. My sister's obsession with Richard may have been even more intense than mine. Since mine was copied from hers, it was probably hers that was greater in the beginning. But while mine was of a shy and sorrowful kind, Involved with my sense of abandon, hers at first seemed to be God's. He fallen in. As always, I followed suit. But while love made her brilliant, at first made me ragged and dull, filled me with a Sad confusion. Tied my tongue or, or made it stammer and flash so unbearably in my eyes that I, I had, had to turn them away. These are the intensities that what one cannot live with, that, that, that he has to outgrow if he wants to survive. But who can help grieving for them? If blood vessels could hold them, how much better to keep those early loves with us. But if we did, the veins would break. That should explode into darkness long before the necessary time for it. I remember one afternoon in fall, and my sister and I were walking along a street when Richard Miles appeared suddenly before us from somewhere. It's startling. I see him bouncing, probably down the steps of Miss Avery's white cottage, emerging unexpectedly from the vines, probably Miss Avery's, because he bore his violin case. And I remember thinking how closely it resembled a little, oh, a small child or, or a duck. About people you knew in your childhood, it is rarely possible to remember their appearance except as ugly or beautiful. No. I do not remember if Richard was light in the sense of being blonde or if the lightness came from a quality in him deeper than hair or skin. Yes, probably both. For he was one of those people who move in light, provided by practically everything about him. This detail, I do remember. He wore a white shirt, and through its cloth could be seen the fair skin of his shoulders. For that first time, prematurely, I was aware of skin. This awareness entered my mind and my senses like the sudden streak of a flame that follows a comet. 
and now undoing, already started by Richard's mere coming toward us, was now completed. And he turned to me and held his enormous hand out. Did it so grotesque that never to be near him without a, a blistering sense of shame that had taken a hand out. I ducked away from him. I, I made a mumbling sound that could have had very little resemblance to speech and then brushed past the two figures, his and my, my demon sisters, and fled into a drugstore just behind. Find out what happened after this fleeting to the drugstore. Because we're going to pick this story up next Friday and take it to its conclusion. Till then. You.